Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Bible study from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, located in Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And this is not a Bible study to miss today. So we are very glad all of you are here that, if, that are attending now. So, And our moderator is Amanda from Missouri. Go ahead, Amanda. Well, thank you very much. And good morning again to everyone. To start today, our quotation is from Message for 1901 by Mary Baker Eddy. True, I have made the Bible and science and health with key to the scriptures, the pastor for all the churches of the Christian science denomination. But that does not make it impossible for this pastor of ours to preach. To my sense, the Sermon on the Mount, read each Sunday without comment and obeyed throughout the week, would be enough for Christian practice. The Word of God is a powerful preacher and is not too spiritual to be practical nor too transcendental to be heard and understood. Whoever said there is no sermon without personal preaching forgets what Christian scientists do not, namely, that God is a person and that he should be willing to hear a sermon from his personal God. And Thank you. our... Um, and I had help selecting that, that quote. There were a couple that seemed on point for this week, so thanks to Tom and Linda for helping finalize that selection. And for our topic today, we're going to be discussing uncovering and un eliminating false prophets. And our readings, part of them were for the lesson this week from Matthew 7. And then Linda graciously also found some pertinent readings that I think are helpful for today's discussion from the Old Testament as well. So to start our discussion, question one, what is a false prophet? It's a counterfeit. I thought I would look up prophet first, and then the opposite would be the false prophet. So from Webster, he says that a person illuminated, in, this is prophet, not false. A person illuminated, inspired, or instructed by God to announce future events, as Moses, Elijah, David, Isaiah. And there's another definition which is good. It's one who pretends, so then the false is the one who pretends to foretell an imposter. That's a false prophet. But it's interesting, Mrs. Eddy's definition of prophet is, a spiritual seer, disappearance of material sense before the conscious facts of spiritual truth. So that was interesting, too. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That kind of sets the stage, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. May I read what Matthew Henry said um, about a false prophet? It's those who would encourage man to expect peace and salvation without repentance, faith, conversion, and holiness of life. So they're deceivers. Thank you. Yeah, that is yeah, very yeah. important. Good. Absolutely. And this, my friends, is what divides real science with what we call New Age. It's just, New Age say any of those things? You have to repent. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> it actually encourages you not to repent. It says, yeah, you're okay just the way you are. Don't bother changing anything. Just be happy with the way you are. Don't do anything. Or get more into materiality, which is the opposite of what Mrs. Eddy's definition is saying. Disappearance of material sense before the conscious fact of spiritual truth. Yes. Whereas this is, you know... This other is more like, oh, my, my mind, I'm visualizing this into being and I'm doing, you know, I'm creating my life and my future and all that. It's thinking more into materiality instead of away from it, which is. Thank you, because yep. it, it, it is used to get what, whatever you want, the new age concept, yes. Um, this is an extremely deep 
subject. We, we will only broach it. I was telling Gary, that, do, do you all know what's in the Eustace book? Very long. He writes very long. I haven't finished all the, the yes. whole thing, but it's very long. He writes a lot about it. A whole chapter on the false prophet. Those of you who want further studying should study it. The beast comes first and then the false prophet. So, and he says something very interesting in that article. He says where uh, he, I believe in his wife, were taught in 1902 by Kimball, the metaphysical college. And that, uh, when Kimball came out, he said that there was a message from Mrs. Eddy saying the only, and I'm paraphrasing this, I'm not reading it, so, the only excuse there was to teach this class was to teach the hidden workings of evil. And it was to be private and not to be broadcast abroad. So, something to think about and something uh, in many ways to get the further teaching of, of this science. Well, now we have so much out. Thank God this literature that had been suppressed is, is now open. It's, it's no longer this secret. But to some degree, there are some things we are wise about what we discuss and talk about. And why would that be? So it can't be used against you. Yes. Around. Do any of you know, sort of, uh, basically, if you will, what Eustace says the false prophet is? I have something here that I found just this morning from our watches last April, and it's from Eustace, page 640. Quote, note this, that each one of them, so-called Christ, parading themselves as the true Christ, the true leader, ends by attempting to substitute his own jumbled and mistaken statement of truth for the true, clear, and succinct statement of science and health. Then he attempts to pull down by innuendo and distortion Mrs. Eddy and her marvelous character and life for the purpose not only of exalting himself, but of dethroning science and health." End quote. Thank you. The beast, the beast is the materiality of the day. It is the thought that everything is material. You're sick because, you know, your nerves are popping here and there, and things are squishing around over here, <laughs> which is actually what it is. <laughs> so it's all based on that, okay? When we get into the false prophet, the false prophet is the deceit, the mental, the mental, what Eustace calls it over and over and over again in his book, everything is due to malicious mental malpractice. Mental, the mental realm. And once this red dragon gets drift, <laughs> the things aren't material, that he can't deceive you with the wishing and the wishing, but he can get into your head, so to speak, and make you think a certain way. Well, aha, he's got you. That is the false prophet. I mean, there are many other definitions, and I'm also going to go into some of those, too. But this is the one that, that is abroad today. This is what's operating. It's a liar and the liar of it. But it is this mental manipulation. Um, he no longer, this whatever evil, doesn't have to go into your house and uh, sprinkle germs all around, shall I say. He can, <laughs> he can <laughs> mentally say, you're not feeling so well today. You've had, you have a return of old beliefs. Whatever. Suggestions. And this is what we have to guard against. And our safety is in what? Doing work for God. Yes. Knowing the truth. 
and yes, the truth, the sword and the tool. Purity is found in divine science. Yeah, and, and in your staying with the one mind. That's why we declare daily that God is mind, my mind, the only pure and perfect mind. Stay with that so that you are not influenced erroneously by the false prophet. Now, the false prophet can come in other ways. I mean, it, it can come as, as a very pleasant person. We've certainly seen, you know, preachers and politicians and other things that would parade as false prophets, right? Yeah. But fundamentally, the false prophet is pretending to know God's will, pretending to know what's good for you, but is really acting professing their own will. And think about it. What, what, what is the motive of the false prophet? Why would anybody want to be a false prophet? <laughs> to benefit themselves. Yeah, there is all, there, behind it, there is a self-serving or maybe fearful Motive. But there's always a fundamental, firm belief that there is life, truth, intelligence, and substance in matter, and there's a limited amount of it. There's not enough to go around. Yeah, one of the things in, in St. Peter's, or excuse me, Second Peter 2, because he speaks about the false prophets, um, he, he says one of the, th the things, some of the things that they do, they, they teach you to despise authority, to do anything for personal gain. They promise liberty, but they enslave you to sin. And also, I thought this was interesting, trained covetousness. They train you. Look at those rich people over there. Look at look at what they have. Look what I don't have. I'm going to hate. Trained. Trained covenants to despise authority. Don't you tell me what to do. I'm going to be as unruly and as obnoxious as I possibly can. There is a reward for that type of rebellious, undisciplined motives, what modes of action. It comes back on you. And then, promise liberty but enslaved to sin. I'm going to give you all this stuff and you're going to be feel better and be freer. And <laughs> but instead, you get more and more enslaved to the source. This is in this is in Second Peter. This is what the false prophet does, and it can sound really good, and it will it will appeal to your base base instincts. Your base instincts. Instead of turning to your father for the source of all good. It will have you look elsewhere and never be satisfied. The false prophet. It's very big around here today. It's very large. You see it in the government. You see it everywhere. And you see it in churches too. And one of the reasons they say, if you pr preach repentance, if you preach discipline, if you preach to turn to God instead of everyone else for your livelihood, are you going to be very popular? No, probably not. This is the Tenth Commandment, do not covet. Makes you wonder why the people rebelled against Moses for 40 years before they finally got to that point. He was telling them something that in their mind they didn't really want to hear, evidently. 
not covet the tenth commandment. It is the commandments are here for a purpose. And I if you find yourself coveting, you get in your closet and shut it up. I don't care if you have every reason in the world. I, I don't care if someone came and just stole everything you had and it, all har horrible things have happened to you. Do not go there. For your own sake. For your own, yes. Because with God, you can rise up out of the worst calamities. And evil will destroy itself if you know it. But if you get into that level or you start hating and coveting and and become angry, then you become part of it, don't you? Then that belief system has got you in its grips. You become its slave. You become its slave. You become the slave of the devil. You will not find the peace, the joy you're looking for. It's just hell upon hell. Another thing I read about false prophets is that they will not connect the dots between the sinfulness of a nation and national calamity. Think of that. They will not connect the dots between the sinfulness of a nation and national calamity. In other words, they will promote all these things I've talked about, despising authority, doing anything for personal gain, promising liberty but enslaving you to sin. And then another said, provides layers of truth mixed with error. It can't sell the error if what? Tell me that it is error. Yes. Because that's its mode, to deceive. That's what I was looking at the word occult, and it means hidden and mysterious, unrevealed, you know, hidden. That's, and the whole the idea that people may even be attracted to some kind of cult or mystery, magical thing that isn't explained plainly out in the open. That's the only way that it can work, that people fall for something like that. The only way, they use, they use tricks, they use mesmerism. They will get you focused on some picayune problem that's not really worth much. In the meantime, they're doing all kinds of things. While you're, that, isn't that what a magician does? They get you to focus on something while they're doing all, of, all other kinds of things? Yeah. Uh, how it works. When it comes to your tailor made, I remember Mrs. Evans said, if it told you you had purple hair, you wouldn't believe it. But if you t it told you you don't feel well, you might buy it. Yes. Really? Sound advice is to try the spirits, as it says in the Bible. And one thing about prophets is it's someone that people listen to. And if they are a true prophet, that is a spiritual seer, then it's wise to listen because the message ultimately comes from God. But if you can imagine somebody standing on the sidelines watching this saying, oh, they listen to people. I think I'm going to step up and do something, see what I can get away with. And try the spirits. Is this motivated by ego or a humble desire to serve God? Well, in events, yes, essentially, it's always your spiritual sense that will discern it. Sometimes that saying it will deceive the very elect. But I read a, a list of things to check with false prophets. Um, now, this is more not the mental onslaught, but perhaps those preaching. One is that they have a, a different source. What would their source not be? The Bible. Spirit. Christ. God. The Bible. I don't know a lot. <laughs> I don't profess to know much. But I hang on to my Bible. And anyone who tries to take it away from me or tell me it's not true, they've got a problem with me. And that's also true of science and health. But, of course, Mrs. Eddy based science and health on the Bible. And people get confused by it. And I've had, oh, I don't you see it as all this stuff that's in it that I don't think is true or whatever. That's why we have the key to the scriptures. That's why science and health explains it. That's why it's so important. That's why they go together. 
Also, the source of that confusion or misunderstanding is the deception that they've accepted somewhere along the way. The littlest child is so receptive to truth because, obviously, it's true. They haven't been educated away from it and deceived. They are receptive. And I know, I know for myself, and I know Florence too, we, we have people that come, and they are so confused because they have been on the Internet, and they are reading everything. Everything. They just decide one thing is true, and then they read something else. What do you say to that, Florence? Well, there's so much out there. There's so many different classes, different um, programs, you know, where they're teaching this and they're teaching that. It's, some are just bizarre, and it's like you get confused. Once you found science, and if, if it rings true to your heart, I mean, I don't see how you could be looking into this study and this program, and it's confusing. And the result I see is that people are so confused and they are really taken away from the science that they are, you know, getting a glimpse of that would save and, and completely um, mixed up. Absolutely. That's one of the ploys of this, the mental suggestion of the false prophet. Oh, you don't believe that. Or maybe that's not right. Or Mrs. Eddy said some things, but not everything. Well, why don't you try this? Read this. Look look what this person said about mm -hmm. Christian science. They say it's no good. Look, somebody died under Christian science treatment. What did you tell me about Materia Medica? Oh, the number three leading cause of death in mm -hmm. America is uh, <laughs> like medical mistakes. mistakes. Yeah. You, don't, you don't hear that much, do you? <laughs> So it, no, but it, one person dies under Christian science, so-called Christian science treatment, and it makes it fun. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big news. Mm -hmm. People quote it forever. I knew someone who died in, under Christian science, therefore I don't want anything to do with it. And, and it wasn't. I, I, it's hard to believe it was true science when that happened. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, anyway, so... Uh, you know, they also um, like to say, "Oh, everybody has the truth," or "It's yeah. all wonderful and good," and every and, and quote a lot of different people and different religions. But in, under the under the concept that you know the peace and love and everyone's good, but it's not a true sense. It is not it's based on false principles. And then I just wanted to add quickly too: if you go back in the Bible, there's the one king who had like 400 prophets of Baal to speak, and this just reminds me of how all we get this information, all this information out there, all these 400 prophets of Baal, and they're all speaking, and uh, it was going on all the way down in the Bible time. Yes, and, and all mass mayhem and confusion. All right, and they all write books, and their books get quoted as a source, and they all do, they all do studies of, you know, human behavior, <laughs> and they write books. That's another reason to pray for our press, too, because the press can be the bales, the prophets of bales, if we're not alert. Oh, then they are. And I think the confusion with what spirituality means, too, is part of it, because all these things, including, like, even, you know, chiropractor and doing, you know, using spirit, spirituality as well, and, you know, it's all mixed, mixed in up. So it's confusing. Maybe. It is. It is. Now, I think it was Elsie she found this week, and we, we have it too somewhere. Uh, what was it, Elsie? A, a note that Mrs. Eddy put in journals to yes. the effect. Go ahead, Elsie. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I have it right. Uh, the note states, uh, I consider my student as capable individually of selecting their own reading material and circulating it as a committee would be, which is chosen for this purpose, Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. So this is why we, we don't tell you what to read. 
as, as the organization has done. But we do expect that you to use your spiritual sense in discerning. There are a lot of things that I just cannot read. They make me sick. A lot of it is the new age. There might have been at one time in my life when I could have read it, and it might have been somewhat helpful, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> I'm not sure. But you get where I, I find it repugnant. Your spiritual sense should, if you know the truth, now what happens is people don't spend the time reading science and health, prose works, and the Bible. They spend all their other time reading all this other stuff. And so that's when they get all diluted and confused and, and they don't have the success that they would have if you stick to that pure source, pure truth. I will say it again. Our church, what we offer in our church, is the creme de la creme. It is the pure science. It is people who knew Mrs. Eddy, who, who uh, came against the organization, some of them excommunicated. They understand the workings of animal magnetism, and you can't go wrong with Martha Wilcox, Kimball, Bicknell Young, Eustace, Carpenter, Carpenter, Carpenter. Peter V. Roth, Kratzer. And believe me, that's a wealth of things to read other than science and health and the Bible and prose work. So if you think you need more to read, well, you might as well just live in a library and we'll see you in the next 20 years from now. <laughs> so anyway, that I, I, I say that as a word to the wise. Okay, so prophet, false prophet, different source, not the Bible. Bible, B-I-B-L-E, not all these other things, okay? All right. Two, a different message, not not whose message? Yeah. Well, that's too broad. Christ. Christ. Christ Jesus. Jesus. You know, I heard someone not long ago talk about, oh, a wonderful sermon, how great it was. There was not one men mention of Christ Jesus or the Bible or any of those things. Therefore, I question it. Why don't you say Christ Jesus? The message has to be Christ Jesus. Why? He's the, the way, the truth, the life, he's our salvation. Because yes. he brought us, he brought us the truth. Yes. He proved it. And no man come to the Father but what? But by me. Yes. Christ Jesus, not all these other names, okay? Not all these other prophets, not all these other whoever. Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, this is the facts, not my opinion. Much better would be if they just had the Sermon on the Mount read exactly. without comment. Exactly. Can, and can I speak to this a minute? Okay. Excuse me. I, I wanted to say something because I'm the one that um, read tarot cards, and that I feel is being a false prophet. And I, you know, went to the occult and got interested in all that and got away from Christian science for a while. But that's the reason why out there in the occult, there are so many different ways you can interpret something. You can interpret the cards different ways. But there's only one way you can interpret Christian science, because it's the truth. Like Mrs. Evans told us, there, are no, there is no gray zone. It's black or white. It's good or bad. There's nothing in between. And we teach it right here in, in this church, which, you know, it makes it so clear what the truth is. There's no mysticism. There's no confusion. It, it is what it is. And, you know, and that's what I love about this church. And that's what keeps me here. That's wonderful. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. There aren't 50 shades of gray. Yes. <laughs> nope. Yes. No, I mean, I was, mean. That's it. Right. No, uh, that was right. one of the things I, too, was most grateful for when I came here. It was no longer this gray zone. It was either right or wrong. It was either right by God or not. And Mrs. Eddy states very clearly, man is not both mental and material. We are not both spiritual and material. The 
belief that anything is both material and spiritual is what leads to all this confusion and false prophecy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's false prophecy in the um, main organization. Anywhere. Exactly. And if you try to straddle the fence, you will you will fall off. And many try. You can't do it. Or, or even, you know, you get to a point here in this church, too. Maybe for a while you can go to the organization. But after a point, it gets where it should be clear as to its illegitimacy. This isn't about, it's never about people. It's never about people. A lot of nice people everywhere. But it's about systems that are ultimately corrupt. And that well, was... It was when, uh, in, in experiencing that, it was like a wall I couldn't get into. Well, and that, that it was just a smooth surface. Good for you. Well, like beliefs and understanding. Beliefs change. Understanding? No. Exactly. And beliefs will change, and you'll just be the swirling currents of mortal mind, we used to call it, the swirling current, and you will just be swirling around until finally you are tired of the swirling. It's very exhausting. Oh, it's so exhausting. That's but you get on that talk. Go ahead. I was going to say that's exactly what turns a lot of good moral people off and the false Christianity, because when people start arguing that there's different points in the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it's clearly stated there exactly in absolute black and white what is good and what is not good, and then they are sitting there arguing about something that uh, just is a personal opinion. Very true. Yeah. You know, when I was researching some of this, there was one, it was a, a website just about that movie, Fifty Shades, or now there's a new one out, but anyway, whatever, Fifty Shades of Grey, and why Christian women are attracted to it, which is, you know, why are they? Um, one, of the, one of the arguments, because I read part of it, said that the enemy desensitizes, um, and we are numb to the things of God. You get so desensitized. And how do you get desensitized? They show you all these pictures. You go to these movies. You just, everybody's doing it. Oh, it's all fine. And so finally, you know, your, your moral compass is getting very wobbly. And it was interesting. There's a quote. It said, all the water in the world can never sink a ship unless it gets inside. All the e evil influence in the world can, can, can never sink a Christian soul unless what? Well, it gets inside. Well, that's where this single-mindedness comes, as he's been talking about. Yes. Right. This is Eddie. Um, and the, pers the persistence. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Shetty tells us in um, her sermon um, on Christian healing, just God is all and in all. That finishes the question of a good and a bad side to existence. And she tells us that an attorney, you can't ever solve a case if you argue on both sides. Right. You can't. Right. But the, we're, we're talking about how to detect the, the other side because it's sneaky. Well, so our first two ways. Different source, it's not the Bible, different message, it's not Christ Jesus. And then another, it says a, a different position. A true believer is escaping corruption, while the counterfeit believer is mastered by it. Hmm? He becomes hateful, he despises authority, he covets. Where's your character going? The right character pursues goodness, knowledge, self-control, just what um, Florence said, brotherly kindness, godliness. The other is arrogant, 
greedy, slanderous, adulterous. And then, of course, you know, which we'll get into are the fruits. Where do those fruits take you? Well, what are your fruits? I mean, just look around you. I mean, I, I know I have people, they, they, are be, they call they are beside themselves with whatever situation they're in. And even after healing of great magnitude, they, they will, oh, it would have happened anyway, or wasn't really Christian science, or whatever, and they go. And so they will be in the swirling currents of mortal mind until they want to. I call it the ark. Years ago, I, I felt like this church was the ark, and free for anyone to get on. I have, um, a, a few weeks ago, or maybe months now, I talked about uh, what Mrs. Eddy says in her book, Miscellaneous Documents Relating to Christian Science, about new age, new thought. And because it applies here, I'm going to go into it again, because it was somewhat brought up last week as well. Um, you think, oh, well, it's harmless. And Mrs. Eddy said, and if you would call, she said, if you were sent a book that is not of science or not correct, that you have to return it. <laughs> it's cowardice not to. And then she says, she talks about these New Age writers. There was one called Ursula Gesterfeld. You can look her up. Is the most dangerous, the most subtle, and why? Because she talks so much truth as to almost deceive the very elect and then poisons the whole by her terrible theosophical terms. It is not her personality that Mrs. Gesterfield is attacking. That means Mrs. Eddy's personality. It is the truth, the truth she's attacking. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. No one can rob Caesar and give God the glory. All she asked of anyone was that we obey that command to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. This is what Mrs. Eddy demanded of us. If Jesus had not declared his divine origin, he would not have been crucified. If Mrs. Eddy had not declared that science was revealed truth, mortal mind would, not, would be proud of it. She had feared that the truth was to be crucified again. That is, would be mixed with the era, that it would be lost. That was what Ms. Mrs. Gesterfeld was doing in trying to simplify her book, but she hoped and felt that it would not be. Now, if you read about her, and I mean, there's a website, she's New Thought, and some people think she's wonderful, but if you read elsewhere about her, you'll find out she viciously attacked Mrs. Eddy. Also, all of these writers, many of them have stemmed from Christian science. Many of them, and yet they give no credit to Mrs. Eddy, or they do very little. One thing in the Eustace book, over and over and over again, Mrs. Eddy, Mrs. Eddy, Mrs. Eddy. Kimball, all of the people that I've mentioned, they give Mrs. Eddy the credit as well she should have. These others don't. They dilute it and then they take it for their own. And many of them have, have made what? Lots of money. Lots money? Of money. Mm -hmm. One sneaky way that they do, they kind of give her credit, but I think it's very uh, alarming is when they refer to her as, as like a 19th century metaphysician or somebody who had, you know, good thoughts. So they're hiding their deception. Hiding, and they're trying to pull her down to their level. She was not. She was the revelator for this age. And really, anyone who doesn't agree with any of this, you can go somewhere else. What is that story? Was it someone who went to Mrs. Eddy or a practitioner for the truth, and then she went away and she researched all these what is that story? She went, she went yeah, all these religions. I don't know the name of the person. Yeah, yeah she go ahead, years Barb. later. No, years? I don't know her name either, but she came back and she, the, all, all that she's been searching was right there. All that she'd been searching for was right there. Mm -hmm. It was a woman who had 
met Mrs. Eddy and was taught by Mrs. Eddy and then left and traveled the world, literally, <laughs> searching for the truth. And after traveling the world, it was a very wealthy woman, after traveling the world several years, came back and uh, met with Mrs. Eddy again and said, you know, I have traveled the world and the truth is right here. You, you had, had it, it all. all. Thank you. Thank you had it all. And again, what the objection is, um, science requires something of you, doesn't it? Not just something. <laughs> it requires everything. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to do that, what did you say, Florence, this week about taking up the cross? Drinking the cup. I mean, the, the, we have to drink it. And, you know, a lot just want the healing, so to speak. I mean, I, I see now that a simple test is, are you willing to read the lesson every day? You know, to do the daily, you know, to read the daily duty, daily duties. Just simple things. And people will leave or will stay. It's amazing. Yes, that's a good test for me now. I mean, you're if you're not willing to even do just that, then what, what? Yes, Why and then here? the other, you know, I'll ask them to read our lesson. Well, that, oh, no, Yes, no. that's, I mean, when I say lesson, I mean our lesson. Our lesson. No, they have to read the organization lesson. Otherwise, no, uh, and why do, we, why do we ask them to do that? Why? Who cares? It's what difference same, does it make? It's the same book, same and, Bible, same science and health. And why? Not the same thought behind it that's putting it together. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. So all of these people... All of these false prophets have one thing in common. They, they, they refuse to give up their human foibles, their belief of themselves as human. And they want to humanize Mrs. Eddy. They want to humanize the science. And they want to tell the world about how they have human how they understand it in a human way. Right, right, and trick you. I think it's interesting that, that people wanted to deify Jesus so that they didn't have to follow his teaching, and then they wanted to humanize Mrs. Eddy so they didn't have to follow her teaching. Yeah. I think it's interesting how that works. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's a lazy way out. Right. Jesus was so special, there's no way I could live up to his example, so I'm not even going to try. And I really don't want to anyway. So it's a way of justifying their unwillingness to spiritualize their own thought. And in saying that Mrs. Eddy was a 19th century metaphysician is the same as uh, Muslims saying Jesus was one of their prophets, you know, in line with going towards Mohammed. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are many false prophets. They're all around. In order to get the pearl of great price, what do you have to do? Tell all that you have. Yes. And what does that mean? Give your whole self. Yes. Go ahead, Charlie. Just give your whole self, and that is entirely everything. It's not material. All of it, some of it may be, but God always supplies you with what you need. It's yourself. It's giving God you. Thank you. Yeah. You sell all the paraphernalia <laughs> that would bog you down. They relinquish all of the false education you've been saddled with. Yes. Yeah, do all like, of the past. Do like Paul said, yeah. his education he sold it. It was all done to him. <laughs> and you can sell it easily because you realize that it's not worth anything. But yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean you sell, you know, your house, your shoes, your coat. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. No. You might have to give up some material, relinquish some things. I don't know. God knows. But um, mainly, yeah. it's yourself, your whole self. No part of you can you withhold from God. And so people ground. And, and, and what, why should I have to do anything? Well, those people can just go on their way. For me, it was 
Go ahead. I was going to add, for me, it was the starting the realization, finally, that there truly is no joy, there's no reality, there's no peace, there's no power, no comfort, there's no nothing in any matter, material existence. And you started out at the beginning, we talked about the scientific statement of being. And it's finally getting to that realization of no matter how comfortable we may, may seem, if there is a, a period of comfort, there's no joy, there's no lasting peace, there's no power in that. And that was the starting realization to start to, to turn away, to, to want to give up life and matter, because it's not lasting. Um, and Mrs. Eddy wrote, it was on page 567 of Science and Health, which I thought it, it may be a broader definition of what we've been talking about, of a false prophet. Of, she writes, that, that false claim, that ancient belief, that old serpent whose name is devil, evil, claiming that there is intelligence in matter, either to benefit or to injure men, is pure delusion, the red dragon, and is cast out by Christ, truth, the spiritual idea, and so proved to be powerless. Thank you. That's great. I know. We yeah. 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 Did you have anything more to say? I know you have a lot to say about New Age. I want to make sure you spoke everything. Well, so far I think I have spoken everything. I think the most important thing that I learned when I got involved with it, and it was long before Plainfield I got involved with it, and then I didn't find any satisfaction with the New Age, but it really puts you to sleep. It gives you a kind of a drugged, peaceful sense. It's not true peace so that you're not coping with life, you're not facing sin, you're not facing the evil that's operating all around, is, and that I'm talking about is um, letting wrong rule the right, letting people walk all over you, or you um, helping people um, continue in their misbehaviors instead of addressing them. And uh, there's one other thought. Oh, and then what I found was I left that because it never fully answered any questions. And when I started working with some self-help books that were a step better because they were Bible-based, and all the ones that Bible-based that kept going back to the Bible felt real solid and practical, and that made a difference. And that's what I found be and before. And then I also found Eustace and Carpenter before I found Plainfield. But Plainfield is really got it. <laughs> No, that, that is so true. I was going to say that about Norman Vincent Peale, because he is based on the Bible. He talks about God in the Bible. And so that sets him uh, several steps. He's not New Age in that respect. He goes back to the Bible. And there is that's the great comfort of the Bible, the truth. But as far as really learning how to handle the animal magnetism, no one explains that but Mrs. Eddy. And, no you know, we, we were talking, I talked to a few people this week about the United States. It, it is the cradle of Christian science. The enemy would like to destroy Christian science. That is its ultimate purpose. All of this stuff you see going around, all of the whatever it is, certainly politically and otherwise, the ultimate, the ultimate purpose is to destroy Christian science. Now we can say, oh, it can't destroy Christian science. Well, I did read recently, Mrs. Eddy said, if there's no one on this earth to be demonstrating Christian science, well, Guess what? <laughs> Go back in the dark ages like they did after Jesus. Yes, it will. And what did the what did the disciples do? Back to fishing. Went to sleep. They went to sleep. <coughs> they slept. This is where we cannot sleep. I don't know how any of us could. <laughs> be nice if we could sleep. <laughs> and that's why you're putting this out there because this and it would like to put you to sleep. So you're you mean not alert and ready to. The disciples all went to sleep. Well, they went to sleep and before the crucifixion, and it led to the oh, crucifixion. Yes, yes. Yeah, but yeah, they Peter did denied. Like, like, yes, but he later on became a good worker. They, they did, but, you know, it's interesting, and if you read the, or see that DVD, A Lamp in the Darkness, you will see right after that, what, 200-year period of active Christianity, uh, this red serpent again, it rose up. It called itself Romanism, the false 
false prophet, saying it's church, and yet went around killing all the Christians, and what else did they do? Took the Bible away from people. Yes, they burned, burned the, the Bible. Bible. Burned them. Okay. Burned it. Mm -hmm. They figure if they can destroy all the people that represent the Christ message, and if they can burn all the Bibles, then there'll be no record of it ever existing. Well, organization with the Roman Catholic Church became this huge organization, and then Christian Science became this huge organization. It, it always destroys. It's all human. Yes, it is. It starts off, perhaps not, but once it gets big and unwieldy, I guess, it, it, things infiltrated and... False prophet infiltrates. False prophet, and it would deceive those who aren't alert. I thought this was interesting. This is also in miscellaneous documents where Mrs. Eddy said that Mrs. Eddy said there were liberated powers of mortal mind. Mortal mind, animal magnetism, taught to know itself, while it claimed to be both good and evil. It was not as dangerous as when aroused, when it knew it was not encased in matter, not confined or limited to the body. This liberated mortal mind was the red dragon of revelation. That the time was coming indeed was here now, when we need not get into cars to do evil, to poison, to murder, and to steal, to do all manner of evil, but would do it in and through mortal mind. Never was there a time when hell was so apparent and crime so subtle and so terrible. Now, that doesn't keep you from going to sleep. I don't know what will. <laughs> so that is, you know, and she said at that time it was going on. I guess it's always been going on. So it just, it just takes different forms and has different names. But one yes. of the interesting comparisons, and, I, and uh, Linda alluded to it, the, you know, the only difference between New Age and Materia Medica that Materia Medica gives you a material pill, drug. New Age gives you a mental drug. They're both designed to do the same thing. Get to sleep. They're both based on the same premise. Why does it matter? And they both take you away from God. And, you know, in reading this, you can almost see the red dragon saying, hmm, okay, so they think everything is mental. Hmm, okay, I'm going to form this new age thing. We'll get it all mental going. But it has no God in it. It has no Bible in it. It has no basis. You don't have to repent or reform. You become my slave. Hmm, I think this is going to work really well. And it has. Mm -hmm. The leaven of the Pharisees. Yes. Yes. That was fantastic with Elizabeth. Yes. Does anybody have that, what she wrote on the forum? About the leaven of the Pharisees. I didn't bring anything. Okay, well, we'll, we'll have it for tomorrow, okay? Because that was, that was excellent, how it works, quietly, changing things. So, um, Amanda, <laughs> I don't know where we are. And I don't know if people might have more things to add, because this was an endless time. Yes, and, and maybe that's the way to do it rather than go through anything further if anyone else has other, <clears throat> pardon me, other things to add. One thing I'll just quickly pick up on is, is um, there's an older journal article, and it's from the 20s, so it was after Mrs. Eddy, but it, it picks up again on the, the wisdom of the serpent, which Mrs. Eddy writes on, of course, extensively, and to be mindful, and Mrs. Singletary, I think you talked about at the beginning with some of Eustace's writings, but how it comes to us. And the one thing, of course, about a serpent is its strength is its ability to hide and to camouflage itself. And in this, in many cases, it comes in the guise of our own thinking. It hides in our thinking. And that's, it's, it's quite easy sometimes to identify what would be false prophets of, you know, the God with a small g, worldliness and things that universally might be condemned. But when something seems to be hidden in your own thought, quite difficult to even even know it's there. And that was the first step of we have to identify it 
alluded to, cast the beam out of, out of our own eye, drag it out, identify it before it can be destroyed, or else it will just lie there very subtly without us even knowing it's there. Thank you. Yes, that's what yeah. Mrs. Bates talks about, mental anatomy. You have to dissect your thought and see, uh, distinguish the false and the true. And God made you capable of that. Nothing can vitiate that power, but you've got to exercise it. The other thought is the truth goes into your inward parts. The Bible talks about that. You take the truth. It goes into your inward parts. Maybe you don't even know there's something down there that's not right. The truth knows. The truth will go in, and it will purify, cut it out, get rid of it. Or reveal it to you. Yes. The divine light shines on the heart. Shine into the eye, shines into the heart, goes inside. Which is why we might want to spend just a couple minutes finishing with question number five. We're there anyway. Question five is how do we stay alert to false prophets? Keep reading the Bible and having these wonderful Bible studies. Thank you, everyone. That's very, very right. You got what you got. Pardon me? You got what you got, the truth you got. Yes. Protect and guard what you have. Draw the line. No one, nothing crosses it. Like, I know one plus one is two, and no one is going to tell me it's three. Yes. For me, it really helps just depending upon God for healing because if I'm not moral and I'm not correct, it doesn't work. I go running off to a doctor or some other thing that hides the deficiency of not building up my moral character. I've learned it's plain feel, and it's not always easy to do, to speak back to a false prophet. Yes. It has to be rebuked. It comes to your thinking. You can speak to it if it seems to wear a face, but mainly you rebuke it in your thoughts. That assumes you're alert, alert to it in the first place. <laughs> That's true. So then you accept rebukes if people give them to you. There you go. And you know, what? Jesus went up to the mountaintop for days, didn't he? We must not forget to have those times of purification and cleansing and just alone, quiet with your Father. Not reading, not doing proofing, not just quiet. Listen. Long wrath of listening to God. We get so busy. That was another thing of Elizabeth's readings. I'm going to quote some of that tomorrow too, but you know, the harsh noises of the day, that was in one of the hymns we sang. I love that hymn and we haven't had it in a long time. We get so listening to all the clangor, clinger stuff going on. You've got to just shut the door, just be quiet and and take in that truth. I call it saturating myself with it. Because only, and this is what Linda said originally, only then can you tell the false prophet. You only know it when you know the truth. And then it just sticks out like a sore thumb. That everybody's on their computers or on their phones and they're totally focused there. They are, yeah. And, they, you know, they're out walking with things in their ears. Listening to God knows what. Yeah, listening to God knows what. I would suggest Everyone, take time this week, every week. You just get alone in your closet. We are we are bidden to do that. And if Jesus went to the mountaintop, and when he would come down from that mountaintop, what would happen? He would heal. He would heal, yes. Thank you, mm -hmm. Fairly. Yep. He healed because he was in that divine state of thought. When tempted, he was able to rebuke it. Yes, he was. That's right. And after you do that, the other thing that will enable you to stay alert, to obey God when he does speak to you, 
every minute of every day. The little things, so-called little things. If you're listening and obeying God each day, God, what would you have me to do? Then the red flags are going to go up when the false prophet approaches you. I mean, you won't be able to miss it. <laughs> Thanks for the gratitude. Yes, thank you. One thing that I want to perhaps end on, because a while ago, someone had asked me about a quote that I never could find about what Mrs. Eddy said about ingratitude. And it is in the Eustace book. Bottom of page 9, 12. Mrs. Eddy also made a statement to the effect that, quote, ingratitude is the original sum total of evil, and its only remedy is gratitude, the highest human quality, its destruction. So, gratitude for this science, what it's done, all for living, when it's speaking will put you in a much better place. I thought that was it. The sum total of all is in gratitude. It's another false prophet, big one, to get you ungrateful, because if it could get you ungrateful, it gets you coveting, it gets you uh, despising authority, it gets you doing all those things. So it will whisper in your ear, you're not grateful, you don't have enough. Sally has more than you do. You've worked too hard and, and you don't have anything. How it gets to you. False promise. Shut it out and count your blessings. And that will be its distraction. And God will lift you up for your obedience to Him. Because it's disobedience to be ungrateful. Isn't it? Okay. Go ahead. What's helped me is something my father said, and he's been a lifelong Christian science. Fields are white with harvest, but the laborers are few. So if any of you are farmers out there. <laughs> and that's the Bible. That is the Bible. We're all needed in this, is this, in this vineyard, and this is part of what we do here. If you want, freely you have received, freely give. Any other comments on this most prolific subject? <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Thank, thank you, Amanda. Everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Well, and I'd like thank to you, thank Amanda. Linda for her clear thought in shaping these questions and topics. So thank well, you, you very you much, You did this, Linda. Amanda. Thank you. You deserve it. Tom was sorry he couldn't be here today, but yeah. anyway. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Group effort. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.